Hey there, everyone, and welcome to The Final Bar. It's Thursday, March 21st. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a cloudy Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the market action using the best practices of technical analysis. Our Stock Charts platform was built on the idea that you can use charts to understand what's happening around you, or at least recognize what's happening around you. Uh, we're going to have a discussion today just reflecting on the fact that the market continuing to be quite resilient. Only one of the 11 S&P sectors down today, and this is the day after the Fed meeting yesterday. We had a nice rally into the close uh, of the Fed meeting yesterday, as we covered on, uh, on our show uh, uh, yesterday. Today, it's further upside, and you're seeing further appreciation in some of those uh, charts. But not everything. There's a, co a company called Apple going through some, uh, some issues at the moment, a little antitrust legislation putting a uh, wet blanket on their attempts to uh, regain some of their previous losses. We'll look at all those charts uh, and more. And a great guest today, by the way, Chris Verone of Strategus Research Partners. With that in mind, let's get our market recap started and look at how the charts evolved. Before we do so, we do want to let you know about a poll we had. Simple question, is the next 10% move in the S&P 500 going to be up or down? 57% of you, almost 6 out of 10, said it's going to be higher. 43% of you uh, said lower. Uh, you know, to be honest with you, having spent a lot of time here uh, in the last week really digging into breadth indicators, digging into stocks breaking out, um, I would probably vote next 10% higher. And this is a big change for me, to be honest with you, because I've been tracking a lot of these danger signs. And I would tell you the biggest risk to this market really pushing higher would be weakness in the mega cap growth stocks, right? Like an Apple breaking down, I think, of as a huge uh, you know, prohibitive uh, sort of uh, input. This is the kind of thing that would prevent the market from going higher. But even with Apple retracing today, everything else is kind of going up. Your biggest gainers today were industrials and financials. And I, that is the key to market strength here. It's not the growth sectors that are really going to impress necessarily. It's the everything else rally. It's the industrial, financial, energy, top three sectors today. They keep going up. While they're smaller market cap wise, there's a bunch of names in there uh, certainly showing that uh, that investors are remaining in stocks. Let's keep going here and see how the charts played out through the course of the day today. The S&P moving up by about a third of a percent. I had a big move out of the open uh, and then uh, sort of uh, lightly higher. Uh, peaked out around 52.60 right around lunchtime. By the close, we came off a bit, but it's still uh, up uh, about 0.3% from yesterday's close. So we finished today around 52.41 and change. The Nasdaq composite around 16,400. That's just up about 0.2%. The Dow uh, just below 40,000, but uh, still up about 0.7%. Mid caps, small caps all up as well. The small cap S&P 600 uh, leading the way higher, up about 1.2% from yesterday's close. The VIX now at a 13 handle. That means below 13 uh, for the first time in a little while. The VIX has had a couple sort of false breakouts above 15, and that's that level that we've talked about, right? As long as the VIX remains below 15, I would describe this as a low volatility environment. We keep getting low, right? We, we were, we're remaining low and slow here in terms of volatility. So a VIX around 13 is a low volatility environment. That tells you conditions are pretty, pretty consistent with slow and steady bull market phases. Interest rates a little up, a little down, depends on where you're looking at on the yield curve. The five-year point slightly higher, finished around four and a quarter. The uh, long bond yield down slightly around 444. The short end of the curve, of course, still elevated. Now, that was what we talked about on yesterday's show. The Fed, you know, really no big surprise, no change in, uh, in interest rate policy at today's meeting. But it was all about the trajectory, right, that glide path of future uh, interest rate uh, changes. And that's where we are. I, you know, markets certainly sort of pricing in this idea that the Fed has a sort of Goldilocks outcome and is able to slowly lower rates uh, in the second half of the year. The market pricing in the first rate cut at the June meeting. Uh, and then uh, from there, we have a couple more cuts at the beginning of 2025. And, uh, and overall, the market is just kind of, uh, you know, doing just fine. At least that's what's being priced in right now. As always, my contrarian hat would tell you one spike in inflation data might uh, turn things a little more negative. But for now, it's, uh, it's all good. The dollar index up again about 0.7% higher for the UUP. That's a bullish dollar ETF. The commodity screen mostly in the red here. You can see that uh, gold and silver price is lower. The SLV, which is the silver ETF, was down the most, almost 3% lower. Copper as well. Crude oil price is coming uh, down as well. Now, crude oil getting above $80 a barrel, I think was a pretty important um, uh, threshold. And you're certainly seeing a lot of energy stocks as I was scanning for stocks making new three-month highs 
uh, yesterday and today, um, finding a lot of energy stocks, a lot of V&P stocks, that's exploration and production, a lot of services names, um, integrated uh, pipelines, a bunch of things starting to uh, break out. Now, these are not vertical names like a meta. A lot of these have been beaten down a little bit, but starting to Im uh, improve for sure on, uh, on an absolute basis. In crypto land, a little bit mixed as well. You can see Bitcoin down about 3.2%. Ether prices uh, down slightly as well. They've sort of been chopping around at the upper end of the range here for the last 24 hours. Bitcoin just here uh, in the last day has spiked up to around 68,000, coming off of it currently just below 66,000. Uh, uh, I saw a tweet from uh, our friend Adrian Zdunczyk at uh, the Burb Nest, who's uh, one of our favorite cryptocurrency experts to bring on the, uh, on the show. He again reinforced the fact that Bitcoin halving is uh, sort of happening here uh, most likely in the next month, and that usually has a pretty bullish uh, sign for, uh, for Bitcoin. We'll see if that structural change once again uh, leads to a further upside for that space. Looking at the 11 S&P sectors, I mentioned your top three gainers today, industrials, financials, and energy, top to bottom. Industrials were up 1%, and that's your best performing sector. On the bottom, you have utilities, which actually finished the day down 0.2%. Everything else was up. Communication services and communica uh, excuse me, consumer staples uh, basically flat for the day. Uh, noticing over here the uh, market trend model that I've run uh, for, uh, for my firm uh, for a number of years, uh, back to bullish on all, all uh, time frames. The small cap model had been negative in the short term. Now, this is intra week, so I like to wait for the Friday's close to lock in any official change. But barring a huge drawdown tomorrow, it looks most likely that the small cap short term uh, model will turn back bullish. And that's 12 green arrows, which may be like a title for a book or report that I will write maybe this weekend, uh, addressing the fact that the market trend model looks uh, overall pretty bold up at this moment. When you look at the Magnificent Seven, I think very noticeably mixed at the moment. Now, on the upside, you have NVIDIA, you know, chopping around, pulling back from all-time highs, but still in a very constructive position. Microsoft and Meta, arguably the most constructive charts, at least consistent uptrends out of these Magnificent Seven names, both up today as well. But if you look, about five of these eight names that I'm listing here were actually down. Apple down 4.1 percent. Uh, antitrust legislation announced earlier today. That's putting a, a quite a damper on, uh, on Apple. It's still above that 38.2 uh, percent retracement level, but starting to pull back a bit. Tesla down as well, and Netflix and Alphabet both down about 0.8 percent from yesterday's close. So it's interesting as well. You have so many names in sectors like industrials and materials and energy and consumer and even technology. You know, breaking out. Uh, some of these Magnificent Seven uh, names are not doing so. And there are plenty of names that I'm not showing here that uh, are not looking particularly strong. But it's a lot of the value sectors, I think, that are most impressive here. All right, let's look at a daily chart of the S&P 500. With yesterday's rally into the close and with today's bounce as well, uh, we are getting a, sort of a nice upside follow through. Today, we are closing below the open. So if there's any, you know, less than opto, I mean, I'm, I'm scrambling looking for something that's not pretty good at the moment in terms of the general market observations. Uh, but I would say the fact that we closed at the lows, I mean, that's not the most bullish thing I've ever seen, but I'm not that worried about it because an uptrend is a pattern of higher highs and higher lows. And in any market phase, you're going to have up days and down days, and you're going to have gaps and all sorts of movements. That's why Charles Dow developed this general idea, which we call Dow theory, which is looking at the trends in the highs and the lows. Today, we're making a new all-time high for the S&P 500. It's closing uh, you know, above 5,200 for the second time in history. And yesterday was the first time. So that's not bad, right? That, that's, that's pretty good. This sort of trading lower into the close tells me going into tomorrow, see if there's some further short-term weakness, maybe a bit of a distribution, some profit taking after this uh, bounce midweek. Uh, but overall, uh, undeniably, this, uh, this chart's in a, in a pretty constructive phase. You know, I always like to think of a line in the sand. Where would you set that alert that tells you if we break this level, revisit 50-50 remains that level for me on the S&P 500. We're obviously well above there, almost 200 points above. So at this point, I think this is a market in, uh, in pretty decent shape. We did have a new IPO today, Reddit uh, going public. Now, the chart is not very exciting. And I will tell you, I'm often asked, and I, you know, I've been asked by media outlets, you know, it's an IPO day, and I'm asked what I think. And I tell them I'm a technical analyst. Until we get some information about how this thing's trading, there's not much I can offer in terms of uh, outlook. So the way that I would think about a stock like Reddit going public, right, you look at a big two-year chart and it's kind of all over here. So 48% above its, uh, its uh, offering prices, basically what that's telling you. The IPO uh, uh, reported level is at 34. We actually opened around 47. And that's, 
if you're wondering what that gap is, not to just uh, belabor this a little bit, but good time to sort of talk about IPOs and what happens. There's an IPO price that is set, but on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, while in a lot of ways the floor of the exchange is a beautiful, uh, you know, well-equipped TV studio, there is some uh, literal function that still very much happens. And one would be the opening price, which in a lot of uh, stocks is still set by uh, a market maker on the floor. The second thing would be an IPO, and that is very much that primary market where a company's first going public very much uh, has the, uh, the, the floor brokers and uh, market makers having a lot of conversations, getting a sense of where the demand and the supply might be, thinking about where it might need to uh, open and sort of making sure that you have things uh, flowing well and the, and the fact that this company is able to uh, have that IPO process go smoothly. So the, the reported IPO, uh, the uh, level was 34. It actually opened up here at 47. That's why it didn't open until the afternoon. I think around 1 or 2 Eastern was when it was finally uh, starting trading. And that's because that was all that happening was figuring out where it's going to open. After that, it spiked very quickly up to 58, settled down just above $50 a share. So that's going to be your uh, close of the uh, first day of trading. What I like to do with an IPO name is that first day, just start with intraday chart. Start with like a five minute chart just to see how things are playing out. And then once you start to get enough data, then I would switch to an hourly chart to start to see how things are building up. And then you can start to look at a daily chart and think about key levels. But you know, the daily chart of Reddit, it's not going to be that meaningful for, uh, for a little while here. So usually want to give it a, a little bit of time to develop that data. Most of the technical toolkit is designed to analyze trends in price. So unless you have enough data to uh, really make a trend, I think you just have to, uh, to wait. So I would start with a shorter term chart as you start to see the, uh, the data populate here. Apple, as I mentioned, uh, very much in the news today with the uh, antitrust legislation. I, you know, we've actually mentioned this before, and I mean, one of the uh, when I'm asked when the market's in a big uptrend, like what's the biggest risk to that magnificent seven trade? I remember being asked this, you know, in 2021 because these stocks are just dominating all of a sudden, and, and my answer was it's the risk of antitrust something, right? Some sort of regulatory pressure which has been brought to bear. And we've seen this, obviously. I mean, all of these companies, Alphabet and Meta and Apple and, and others, have been dealing with regulators and, uh, and, and things just because they're at the size where that tends to happen. Um, this is what can happen when, uh, when, when something really looks like it could weigh on uh, the stock's price. Now, what's interesting is Apple has been going down for a little while now, right? I mean, Apple is one of the few names that actually peaked in July of last year and failed, has this huge double top. And on the weekly chart, it's just this very clear double topping pattern there in 2023. So all we're doing is kind of rotating to the lower end of that range. Now these lows around 165 to 167, that's a 38.2% retracement of the way back down to the January 2023 lows. I think holding these levels, pretty important. We break below 167, maybe 165 to get a little, little, little more room. Uh, this is a pretty negative chart that you know already has been a laggard because it's been not going up while most other things have been doing so. Adobe is another one where you're seeing a bit of a, of a pullback here. And again, uh, different timing of it, but also with a, a pretty significant uh, double topping pattern, right? A peak in November, a peak in January. We're now making lower highs and lower lows. That failure to get above the 50-day moving average, I think, was a really negative sign there the second week in March. Now we're gapping lower. And again, we just keep making lower lows and lower highs. That is not a uh, good look for this chart. And also look how the momentum has now shifted from a bullish range to a bearish range, right? So all the evidence is telling you names like Adobe probably better to be avoided until you find some uh, stability. Now, it's not all bad, right? You have a micron gapping higher by about 14%. It did trade above uh, around 113 before settling down and closing uh, just below 110 a share. This is a semiconductor name, of course. Semiconductors has been a, have been a pretty impressive group. This is the SMH. Again, just a nice breakout in November off of that October low test of the 200-day. And the SMH has been just a fantastic success story. It's in the top 1% of ETFs. Uh, according to our uh, scooter rankings, looking at the ETF space. So Micron's gap higher, again, just the latest move. Now, anytime you have a gap like this, it's interesting to see what happens during the day. So there was actually distribution. We opened way up here, but then through the course of the day, Micron actually traded lower. I think that's one data point to pay attention to. What happens tomorrow is often way more important, I, I would argue, because that's the, the follow through, right? Do you see buyers coming in willing to own this stock at $110 a share? Or do you see more selling, right, as, uh, as investors are tentative and, and, uh, and see this as an overextended, overbought uh, stock. So I would keep an eye on MU uh, tomorrow. Western Digital is uh, another one as well. Now I'm going to look at the candle chart just to zoom in a bit here. 
Um, this is a, a chart just to show, you might call this like a shooting star candle. I don't feel great about that because a shooting star, you really want the open and the close very, very close to the bottom of the range. It's almost half of the way up here. So I would just say this as a, as a down close. I don't know if I would attribute a particular candle pattern to this, but look at the highs that we established in, uh, in the uh, beginning of March, right? We gapped, uh, traded higher off of this February low, an initial gap, had a subsequent gap there at the end of February. And this nice big update, and then from there, that's been pretty much it. Look at these long upper shadows, which just show you how we haven't had a lot of follow through above that kind of $65 level. Today's gap higher went right back up to that point. We once again traded up to 66 and once again came down. So this more and more, every time we test that resistance level and fail, sort of further validates as a short term level. This might be one of those levels of resistance we want to uh, avoid. So again, I think Western Digital is a pretty impressive chart above 66, but until we can get it close above those levels, I think it's one you probably want to, uh, want to be wary of. Wrote an article for uh, CNBC Pro uh, earlier today uh, on home builders. And you know, when I think about uh, reflecting on what we learned from the Fed, and I would argue not a whole lot, what we learned was no real negative surprises, that's good. No real hawkish tone, I think that's good. Um, you know, a better sense, I guess, of the trajectory and just confirming that uh, you know, rate cuts are most likely happening here probably in the second quarter and continuing a couple more uh, through the end of this year. One space that is certainly trading higher uh, from that moment on are home builders, right? Look at Lennar, Toll Brothers, NVR, um, uh, DR Horton. These are all names that are uh, sort of making the new three-month highs list today. I'm looking at ITB today, which is the uh, home builder ETF that I like to track. There are two of them. This one's a little more of a pure play on uh, home builders. The other one, I think it's XHB, has a little more of like the Home Depot kind of names, um, which also are doing just fine for the record. Uh, but home builders are uh, sort of breaking out. And what's interesting about this is from a technical perspective, it's a pretty decent setup, right? Higher highs and higher lows. But also think about the implication of mortgage rates coming down and houses becoming more affordable. You're seeing anything related to homes or home construction doing just fine. Home builders like Dior Horton are doing just fine. Home Depot and Lowe's are gapping higher. Home Depot uh, trading almost uh, 3% higher at today's close. So you know, really seeing a renewed strength in a lot of those, uh, those key names and not just the FANG stocks or the FANG sectors, but kind of the everything else rally seems to be alive and well here on a Thursday afternoon in late March. That's it for our market recap. We're going to bring on today's guest, Chris Verone, here in a few moments. Just one quick reminder before we do it, and that's to encourage you to send us your questions. We're going to do an all mailbag episode on tomorrow's show, and we'd love to answer one of your questions in our next mailbag episode, probably the end of next week. You can email us your questions at thefinalbar at stockcharts.com. We're on the Twitters at FinalBarSCTV. And here on YouTube, just put a comment below the video that you're watching. We'd love to hear from you. Feedback on our show, on our guests, always welcome. But we would especially like to hear your questions. And we we'll hope to answer yours in our next mailbag episode. I want to bring on today's guest, Chris Barone. Chris is the head of technical and macro research at Strategus Research Partners. Joining us from New York, Chris, good to see you again. How are you doing these days? All right. Dave, it's great to be here. Always fun to be on the show. Thanks for having me. No, I appreciate it. You have, you have a great perspective. And again, I, I know you, you talk with a lot of people doing a lot of things. So I really appreciate you taking a few moments to just give us a sense of where you're at. Fed meeting this week ended up being, I sort of, I mean, I guess much to do about nothing. There weren't any major changes, but coming out of this Fed meeting, we've certainly seen a risk off feel to the tape. What's your sense of things sort of continuing this big upward move kind of uh, as the week progresses? Yeah, you know, we have a saying in our work that surprises tend to break in the direction of the trend, right? Mm -hmm. And the trend in all this stuff was up. And it certainly wasn't yesterday's Fed press conference that was going to disrupt that. And it's funny, um, I, I was talking this morning uh, with, uh, with some clients who, who said, wow, did you see the surprise out of the Swiss National Bank uh, this morning cutting rates? And I said, well, surprise, um, that's not the term I would use because the bond yields have been in downtrend. The currency has been in a downtrend, um, right? The market has a, a pretty clever way of sniffing some of this stuff out um, often before the news materializes. So I think, if anything, kind of putting the, the week in context, um, the, the, the trend carries on. The, the pro risk tone carries on. There's probably some little hints of momentum exhaustion in some corners, but I think by and large, the status quo is still intact here. It certainly seems like the breadth conditions have been improving here pretty steadily, right? And we've seen a lot of 
sort of non, I guess, magnificent seven sectors starting to improve, things like industrials and others where you're seeing some really nice moves to the upside. When you think about market breadth conditions, do you have a go-to way of thinking about market breadth, that, which, I, again, I would, I would imagine whatever you're looking at, probably pretty constructive here, but what, what's your go-to look there? Yeah, well, it's, it's funny you bring it up. One of my kind of big pet peeves the last few months has been this idea that it's been a narrow market because you know that it hasn't and the data suggests that it hasn't. <laughs> Um, certainly, there's been a degree of outperformance in a couple of stocks that has been significant. But for four months now, we've been talking about 80 plus percent of stocks in the S&P above the 200 day moving average. I mean, even the small caps, which are criticized as a big laggard here. Remember, they're coming off one of their best November, December performances ever. And their only indictment in the first you know, two and a half months or three months of 2024 is that they simply consolidated. And if anything, they look like they're about to break out here. You saw consolidations in bank stocks, which are now resolving higher. You saw corrections in energy, which are now resuming trends. Yeah. And you have some sleepy bases and breakouts in the material space. So at a minimum, your laggards are at least participating. You can maybe start to make the, um, the suggestion that perhaps there's some subtle leadership changes. I don't even think we need to go that far. The laggards are at least participating. It's why you have 82, 83% of issues above 200 day. It's funny with small caps, we have the chart of the Russell 2000 on here. I mean, it, it, it's, it's not been a bad chart by any stretch. It's just not been as, as incredibly strong as I feel like some of the large cap names. I mean, do you think of, of small caps obviously bouncing the last uh, couple of days? Are small caps an area I, I think have been off radar for so many because that's been the narrative. It's been large over small. Do you think there's a catch up trade that there's more to be had to that than what we've seen so far? I'm always torn about this phrase, catch-up trade, because yeah. I never want to own the catch-up trade. I want to own the strongest <laughs> groups in the leading sectors and the biggest, right? Or conversely, I want to be short the worst groups in the worst sectors. Um, but when I look at the small caps, the, think about that you know, October, November, December period. I think December 14th, you had the best new high reading in the Russell 2000 ever. Um, so the 20-day high surge in Russell 2 was the best in 40-something years. I think Russell 2 was conceived in maybe summer of 1978. So 40 plus years, best new high rating in uh, uh, in December. And all they've done since is this narrow 7% range. They've held the 50 day on every single test. I think your bias has to be that IWM breaks out and breaks out decisively here. Uh, look at the individual pieces in particular. Um, small cap banks have a little bit of a bid underneath them again in the last couple of days, but importantly, some of the big weights like healthcare are still acting pretty good. Mm. Small cap energy is actually a much larger weight than it is large cap energy, and that has shown some signs of life. So I don't know if this is going to be like bull market structural leadership, but it doesn't have to be. It has to be involved. And not to mention, um, these small cap industrials have been as good as anything. I mean, mm. look at the small cap industrial stocks. They 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 look like AI charts. Um, they've been that good. <laughs> it's been some incredible moves. And, and as you mentioned, I, I'm not super surprised because if you've been following the charts, we've seen a lot of impressive moves. I mean, I feel like any one of the 11 sectors, you, you, you have a name or two. I mean, even utilities, you have like an NRG that's kind of breaking out, right? Well, with energy in particular, right? I, mean, I think that's been a space that I mean, clearly has been underperforming other sectors. Crude oil now back above $80 a barrel. The XLE is starting to come up. If you're not in energy, is now a time to be revisiting that or not as much as other places that you're seeing? What's your thought there? Since the day of yesterday, so uh, today's Thursday, yesterday, Wednesday, uh, you had 70% of the energy sector make a new three-month high. It's the best reading in over a year. Um, you know, that's one thing that the rally in energy last summer into the fall kind of lacked. You never really saw that big breath expansion. It looks a little bit more reminiscent of what we saw in 2021 into 22, when with every advance, the new high list swelled, right? And, that, and that's what we want to see, because we want to play um, where there's the fattest pitches to hit. And I look at fat pitches through the lens of the new highs, and the new highs expanding. We got that in energy this week. I think it's a stretch to say, like, this is new leadership within the market. Yeah. But um, certainly, I can lean into this and, and be bigger in energy than maybe I, I have been for some time. It is overbought in the short term. I think a big test is going to be how it kind of digests this overbought condition. And, you know, maybe the model for how something should digest an overbought condition has been gold, right? Because you had the surge in gold prices in mid-February, early March. And talk about very benign consolidation the last two weeks as 
gold um, gold has kind of you know chopped in that you know, call it twenty one fifty to twenty two hundred zone. Um, pretty pretty benign. Uh, and you're, you're hitting on a number of things that are, I mean, it, it's, it's amazing. I feel like it's not hard to find something that's working somewhere. Something like gold in particular. I mean, do you own gold when it's making new all-time highs when it feels like everything else is breaking out too? I mean, what's like the value proposition of owning a gold here versus so many other things that are sort of making that new 50-week high? How do you think about it? So I, I do own gold. I, I can't really probably own too much of it because as you point out, it's, it's breaking out in the absolute sense. I, I wouldn't say it's breaking out relative to financial assets. Mm. Um, and you know, that's an important question, Dave, because the, the, the question we've gotten from clients the last several weeks is, does gold breakout portend something ominous uh, out there? And it's a fair question. Um, and you know, there's any likelihood that six months from now, you look back and you say, oh, something went wrong. It was so obvious gold was breaking out. But I want to a nuance that a little bit. I, I think if gold was portending something ominous, you would see credit conditions also deteriorating and you would see gold outperforming financial assets. And that's not what this is. Um, so my suspicion is gold is a message that we probably don't lose bond yields a lot higher from here and we probably don't lose dollar a lot higher from here. That's my guess. Um, you know, that's the gold versus S&P chart. Yep. It, it's... Uh, if gold were to make new relative highs versus S&P, then I think you begin to entertain the idea, well, wait a second, what's the real message going on here? But yeah. that's just not the case yet. Yeah, no, it's a good point. We, we would say uh, rocks cover paper in this particular environment, right? Sort of the, or, uh, or paper <laughs> covers rocks, right? The, uh, the paper assets are still doing just fine relative to uh, hard assets. You had mentioned a moment ago, uh, you know, how there's some, uh, some similarities, at least between now and kind of 2021. Uh, which makes sense, right? You kind of have a low volatility. We have a nice sort of slow and steady grind higher, not a lot of drawdowns. Is that the period that you're sort of thinking of as similar to what we're seeing now? Or is there another period looking back that feels like a 2024 right here, something we would think about yeah. as, a, as an analog of sorts or no? It's a good question. Like a little little play on words. Uh, the title of a note last week we, uh, we wrote was a uh, was a mid 2000s macro dream. Um, <laughs> meaning uh, looking at that 03 to 06 period where you know, I, I was just kind of remarking on, you know, gold is broken out, copper's broken out, the Cospi is broken out, maybe a little hint of life in China. Uh, I've seen that before. And yeah. I, I saw that when I was new in the business. And I remember those kind of 03, 04, 05, 06 period. And yep. um, that's, that's a little bit reminiscent. Now, it's too soon to declare like tech's leadership is past us because that's just not the case yet. Uh, are there some subtle cracks in the momentum trade? There probably are. But I think emphasizing the rotational nature of this market, what, what you hit on, Dave, you have other groups that have stepped up and, and filled the void. I don't want to pretend, though, like the second largest stock in the world has not broken down because it has. Um, my mother used to say nothing good happens after midnight. I've experienced that in my business with nothing good happens under the 200 day moving average. And I mean, look at Apple today, right? It's behaving as if it's a stock in the downtrend. So I want to be aware of that. I want to be aware that Adobe has broken here. I want to be aware that AMD might be starting to show some signs of fatigue and break. Um, but I think the good news for now is you have this rotational nature to this market that has absorbed uh, some of that. Mm. You know, 2Q feels like it could be a frustrating quarter where maybe some of the big momentum stuff stall. The breath would actually probably improve, to be honest with you, as yeah. you get some of these laggards involved. But it may be frustrating for the bulls if, if, if some of the real winners um, stall or pause. When you look forward now into Q2, I mean, I mean, the first quarter has obviously been remarkably strong and, and fairly consistent here mid-March. Still plenty of names doing just fine. What do you think is the biggest risk going into the second quarter? Is it some of those momentum names, some of the AMDs and Apples breaking down further and all of a sudden it starts to feel like it's dragging others down? Or is it a change in so, interest rates? Like what's top of mind for you? So uh, great question. I, 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 I'd kind of start with Apple and I kind of put that in its own category because this is not just a momentum stock that broke. This is a stock that's been topping for eight months, nine months. Yeah. And it never made new highs along with its friends. Um, when you're at the kind of the, the peak of the momentum of the momentum trade, right? I forget who used to call it, momentous momentum, right? right? Um, uh, it, it, it was never involved uh, uh, in that. Um, so I, I kind of put that in its own separate category. 
when you look at you know what else could disrupt what is a pretty tranquil environment here i mean certainly rates now it's not my base case but call it above 450 455 would probably be a problem particularly for the momentum corners of the equity market again not my base case and i say not my base case because I still see a lot of right shoulders in global bond yield charts. You know, whether you look at UK tens or German tens or Italian tens, we saw the Swiss yields break today. Those look more like right shoulders. Um, we'll see how that plays out. Above 450, I might need to rethink whether I'm too neutral or too bullish bonds and maybe need to get a little bit more um, more bearish there. $90 crude would probably raise an eyebrow. Uh, mm. 90 bucks is where the discretionary stocks began to falter in late 21. So I kind of have that number circled in my head. And it's funny, uh, yesterday, myself and our, our team, we we had what we call an on-site. We, we sat down for six hours and looked at every single chart in our library. And one mm. of the questions that came out of that presentation or, or that um, or one of the things that came out of that dialogue was, how much energy strength is too much energy strength, right? right. At, at, at what point do you need to say, whoa, wait a second, this is now a bit of a change. What is that? What does that pretend? So, I mean, you always want to, particularly when the status quo seems very well intact, I think you want to be asking questions about what could disrupt it or what could change it. And, you know, we spend our days, um, probably more, uh, more of our days looking for what could disrupt things as opposed to uh, where are we positioned in context of the status quo. Great lesson there and how to uh, make sense of a bull market, what sort of uh, warning signs to maybe look for. Chris, great to see you. Thanks again for giving us some time and sharing some insights with you. Uh, be well there in New York. We'll talk to you again soon, all right? Always a pleasure, Dave. Thank you. That's Chris Verone. Chris is the head of technical and macro research at Strategus Research Partners coming to us from uh, New York. That was, that was beautiful. But what, we hit on so many different things, but what I love about Chris's take is just that the, you know, there's been this narrative, right, of narrow leadership. The charts have told you in a lot of ways otherwise, right? They've shown that stocks are breaking out. We've recognized a number of times how many names are making new three-month highs, new 52-week highs. They're out there. Thinking about when conditions are strong, which they seem to, what sort of uh, warning signs would you look for? A crude oil above a certain level, an interest rate above a certain level. Until then, it looks like a slow and steady uh, incline. And I like that relationship back to 2021. I, I would agree with that in terms of the volatility in the overall trend. Great take there, as always, by Chris Verone uh, of Strategus Research Partners. We've got to wrap the show, folks, and go to the three in three, three charts in three minutes that tell the story of this market environment. Here is chart number one. So great discussion with Chris Verone, uh, today's guest, and I really like his uh, comments on, on how really, I mean, it has not been a narrow rally. And, and I think that sort of phrase has become less and less of an accurate description of what our experience has been. And I've seen that just by a regular weekly scan of stocks making new three-month highs. And when I did that earlier today for my Market Misbehavior Premium members, I was struck by how many industrial stocks were reflected. And it was a little of everything, trucking, um, uh, railroads, heavy construction, commercial vehicles, um, so many parts of that industry, airlines. I mean, it's sort of like everything in that sector seems to be uh, pushing to the upside. Caterpillar's breaking out. So the XLI was uh, one of the charts that I wanted to, uh, to bring up here as our first of our, uh, our three charts at the end of the, uh, of the episode. Making new 52-week highs. Now, the first 52-week high in recent memory was in December. So coming off of the October low, it took about six weeks, and then we made a new high. Look how we pulled back to that breakout level and then just continued the move. So technical analysis 101, right? You break above resistance, you retest that breakout level, and you find support, and then you break higher. And it's just been above two upward sloping moving averages, right? So regardless of what you think about leadership or who should own what when, charts that are doing this tend to be the types of things that I would want to have in a portfolio. And if you've been following that, you've been, uh, you've been rewarded, not just in absolute price gains, but in relative performance. The last six to eight weeks, the XLI has been steadily outperforming the S&P. It's actually making a new three-month relative high today. So overall, I think it's an interesting place. And if you've been ignoring industrials and you've been focusing just on tech and communication services, this is your wake up call. There are other sectors doing just fine. Make sure you spread it around a little bit. Now, charts number two, or, uh, chart number two to share with you, just want to highlight a couple names. When I scan for stocks making new three month highs, I find a lot of things that look like that chart of the XLI, which has been making new highs for quite some time. So this is looking for things making new three month highs a little earlier on, just breaking maybe above their 200 day moving average. Three charts in three very different sectors all fit that criteria. PayPal Holdings making a higher low in February, just getting above the 200-day. I'd like to see it get above that January high, but 
overall setting up pretty well for that potential breakout. Devon Energy, DVN, which is obviously in the energy sector, getting above the 200-day moving average after a little double bottom there in mid-January into early February, breaking above that January high uh, just in the last couple weeks and overall pushing even further. Tyson Foods, this is a food products name, right, and consumer staples. Look how similar these charts look, though, and that it made a new low, started to make higher lows. Here we actually made a higher low right at the 200-day moving average, and now it's starting to uh, break uh, higher, making a new, uh, you know, again, almost a one-year uh, closing high today. So it's not all overextended names. And to be honest with you, I'm inclined to, uh, you know, sort of rotate some, uh, some positions, take some maybe some of those bets off and focus on some of these earlier emerging trends. And that's an exercise that if the bull market continues, that, that's where we might be rewarded as well. Finally, don't neglect those lines in the sand. That red line in the sand was the level for me on Apple. We actually broke that uh, at the end of February, right around uh, leap day, we then pulled back even further to around 169. That's a 38.2% retracement of the way back to the January 23 lows. Now we've rallied back up to that 180 level, that uh, line in the sand, and today failing, of course, a news event causing prices lower. But the chart doesn't really care about the news. It cares about the levels. And so people are obviously reacting very negatively to this antitrust legislation. I would say a break below 169 really completes that lower high, lower low. But overall, the momentum has been uh, fairly bearish. And the relative strength, of course, has been bad. It's tough to own a name that is going sideways when it feels like everything else is going up. Folks, that's a wrap for the show. I want to thank you so much for joining us every weekday after the close for the final bar. A special thank you to Chris Verone of Strategus Research Partners joining us from New York. For Stock Charts and Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be well, stay safe, have a good night.